Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Ethernet Basics SLA Testing Using RFC 2544 and EtherSAM Y1564. This webinar is part of an educational series, so for more information, you can check the webinar page on Expo website. My name is Emily Silvest, and I'll be your moderator <coughs> for today's session. Before we get started with today's event, I would like to cover some housekeeping information with you. First, you can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will address the question at the end of the webinar. For the best viewing experience, <coughs> we, re we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any program or browser session running in background that could cause issues. We also recommend using Google Chrome as a browser to listen to this webinar. This session will be recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing on our website approximately one day after the conclusion. It can be accessed using the same audience link you used today to log in. So today's presenter is Kevin Perez, subject matter expert at Expo. So without further ado, <coughs> I would end the presenter control to Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Pires. I am a, uh, a subject matter expert applications engineer with Expo. Uh, I've been with Expo for a little over 17 years, but I've been in the telecom industry since, geez, 1991. Um, so there's been a lot of changes over that time. And one of them in particular is kind of the transition to Ethernet for carrier level type of uh, services, right? So when I first got into telecommunications, I was, you know, primarily working on T1s, you know, low bit rate type of, uh, of, uh, of uh, bit streams. <clears throat> and Ethernet was really more for the realm of the local area networks, right? It wasn't something that we provided our enterprise class customers, right? Because we really couldn't maintain the level of service that, <clears throat> that we're accustomed to for those types of customers. Obviously, the world has changed tremendously since then, and Ethernet's been around for a while. So in today's session, it's, it's kind of a basic entry-level look at SLA testing using the two most common test methods in the industry today. Uh, and that's RFC 2544 and Y.1564. So we'll talk about the differences between the two, uh, how they work, the strengths and weakness, you know, weaknesses, the setup, that type of stuff. So my presentation style is a little bit different if you haven't sat in on any of it. I'm not really a big deck person. I'm more of a whiteboard and kind of live demonstration. So I have a network within my little makeshift office here at home <clears throat> that I have a test set that I can log into. We can set up a test, you know, uh, look at some of the results and stuff like that. And then I draw quite a bit, right? And so that's kind of what I'm known for. Um, so, you know, we'll, you know, we'll go ahead and just, uh, uh, you know, jump right into it. And so basically, <clears throat> um, what we'll be talking about is really Ethernet testing to a large degree, right? Um, and so Ethernet literally feeds the world today. And as I mentioned before, when I was a technician, that wasn't the case, right? It was all T-carrier stuff. It was Sonnet. You know, it was SDH, those types of uh, different types of protocols and services that we were primarily working on. And to a very large degree, we're doing bit, bit error testing, right? So bit error rate testing, BERT, was primarily what we were doing at that time. That was predominant test application for qualifying those types of services, right? And there wasn't a huge learning curve, right? If you were working on a T1 today and then all of a sudden you're on an OC192, it's basically just a PRBS pattern, right? You know, you might have a stress pattern, some sort of framing, depending on the application. Um, but it, essentially, you're, you're just measuring a PRBS pattern, right? And so there wasn't a huge learning curve. The test equipment got more expensive, a different type of interface, that type of stuff. But it wasn't like a huge transition. But Ethernet, on the other hand, when it hit the scene for most of us that were technicians, right? I was literally working on an OC192, and then all of a sudden, I'm going to Ethernet boot camp. Right. I am starting to look at RFC 2544, uh, Etherbert, those types of applications. So when we look at, you know, primarily <clears throat> just this is kind of a high scale view of a network. Right. And so if we think about it today, when we're providing services to our customers to a very large degree, we're feeding the bandwidth with Ethernet. Right. Obviously, there's 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 still sonic carriers out there. In fact, yesterday I was troubleshooting an OC12 with a bunch of STS1s, you know, 12 STS1s, uh, you know, tripped out. 
And so it's been a while since I've done that, but they still do exist, right? So they're not going away. In fact, you know, when the world ends, it's going to be cockroaches and the FLM 2400, right? Things just run. They just run. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at this high-level view of a network, right? And so we have basically our centralized hub or switch we're working from, right? And, you know, just different types of networks that are out there. But to a very large degree, if you think about it, you know, when we're leaving, you know, this particular switch, you know, we might be feeding these different types of services with different types of protocols or, or, or uh, types of bandwidth, right? And in this example, we'll stick primarily to Ethernet, right? So we are feeding a lot of these services here with something like 10 giggy. So 10 giggy services. And as it goes down the line, closer to the customer. And so in this particular example here, we have fiber to the home. Could be GPON, could be EPON, NGPON2, whatever, right? So basically what it is, is Ethernet feeds the OLT. So Ethernet feeds this OLT out here. And essentially, that's all Ethernet. So Ethernet feeds the OLT, and then coming out of the OLT is going to be, you know, GPON encapsulation, whatever type of translation technology is needed for the far end equipment, right? And if you think about it to a large degree, that's all we're doing, right? That's all we're doing <clears throat> is that we're feeding bandwidth to these different types of services. You know, coming off of here is also still 10 gig ethernet, one gig ethernet, whatever, it's ethernet. Uh, and it's feeding this cell site. So this mobile cell site, it could be 4G, it could be 5G, whatever. So basically we're feeding this particular router here with ethernet and then it converts over to something like CIPRI, right? eCIPRI, OBSI, whatever type of technology you're using. So to a very large degree, we're taking Ethernet and translating it to somebody else, right? CIPRI, GPON, uh, could be XDSL, whatever. But the message is, <clears throat> this is fed by Ethernet, right? And of course, on the backhaul side, as you have more and more sites across the, the country, so you have another switch over here, and that's being fed, you know, would say 100 gig, Ethernet. Again, Ethernet, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me. And so, um, when it comes to Sonnet, the traditional backhaul uh, uh, type of technology that we used, we've essentially, you know, stopped at OC768. And even OC768 was difficult to get working. I've worked on a few of them. They were a challenge, right? Because of the code modulation, we started running into some limitations and whatnot. And of course, the technology has just kind of ended for us there. So now we're looking at 100 gig Ethernet, 400 gig Ethernet, 800 gig Ethernet. And so that's kind of the future of the technology. And we need to verify the SLAs, right? And so the SLAs between all these different devices. And so whether it's on the backbone side, right? Between your two different locations, between your CLEC and yourself, between your backhaul provider and yourself, test Ethernet here, right? You test Ethernet here to the cell site. So each one of these locations where you end up over to the DSLAM. They're all fed by Ethernet, so you have to somehow qualify those different portions of your network, and that's why we're gonna be talking about 2544 and Y.1564. So I'm gonna step back just a little bit, and I like to talk about, believe it or not, the OSI model. Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna bust out you know, the, the napkin with the Ethernet drawing on it, I don't do that. But I do talk about the OSI model because it's incredibly important, right? And the reason for this is it's important to know where you are within your network, right? What your DMARC is, what your area of responsibility is, right? I am sitting in front of my computer. So I'm at layer seven, right? 765, depending on you know, how you look at it. Um, so layer seven is the application layer. I'm running Outlook. In this particular situation, I'm you know, running a whiteboard and some different types of applications and whatnot. Um, and so looking at the OSI model, you know, you have your seven layers. And for most of my career, I was at layer one, right? I was at layer one at most of my career. So layer one, in fact, we'll start the, the other way around. We'll start at layer seven. So layer seven, we're not going to spend much time on these three layers here. And so layer seven is essentially your application, right? Uh, Outlook, whatnot. So Although I'm oversimplifying this, I like to think of this layer here as mostly IT, right? And again, I'm oversimplifying it, right? This is, you're working on your applications, uh, you know, your Outlook, 
computers, you know, the, kind of the communication and, you know, across the back plane of your computer. For today's discussion, we're not going to deal with that, right? So we're going to leave, you know, the top three layers alone. We are going to focus on the bottom four layers, right? And so I'll start back again at one. So layer one is where I've worked the most of my career. So I actually started off in excavation. I used to run a backhoe. I was a splicer, dug holes, splice pits, those types of things. So I was in excavation uh, for a long time, putting cable in uh, in the Southwest US. And so when we look at layer one, and so layer one is essentially, you know, this is physical layer, right? So this is layer one here, right? Physical layer. This is fiber. This is copper. This is coax. Um, you know, your, you know, uh, your amplifiers, DWDM, you know, um, this is layer one stuff. If you're shooting an OTDR trace, layer one, right? If you're measuring power levels, layer one. If you're doing a bit error test, this is layer one. So from our perspective for testing, this is where your bits are at. So if you're standing in front of a patch panel and you want to do a test, right? Um, or if you're at a layer one DWDM, this is traditionally where you do BERT testing because this is where your ones and zeros are at, right? This is where your code modulation is at. That's layer one. Um, so layer one, if I'm layer one, I'm doing a bit test. I'm sending a PRBS pattern and, and that's it, right? You know, layer two, you know, we, we start getting into, you know, layer two. Layer two is basically your data link layer, right? And to dumb it down, this is most of where Ethernet lives here. So this is where we're spending a lot of time is, is at layer two. Um, and so layer two are your switches, right? Your switches live at layer two, which means this is where our MAC addresses are at. So now we are all of a sudden MAC aware. So if you're at layer two, if you're in front of a switch, you're in front of an address aware env environment. And I'll be using that term several times here, address aware being you need some sort of addressing, right? And at this level, primarily it's a MAC address, VLANs, those types of things. This is where your frames live, right? So this is where your frames live, and I'll move that out of my head here. So essentially, this is where your frames live right now, right? And so um, if you're standing in front of a switch, a switch handles frames. So you need to do a test that looks at frames, frame rate, throughput, that type of stuff. And so we'll, we'll get deeper into that when we talk about the different test applications, right? So layer two. MAC addresses, frames, that's where we're at. Switches. Layer three here, this is where you start getting into things like routers, right? This is where you start getting into things like routers and those types of things. Um, and so, you know, basically, when you're looking at layer three, what we're looking at is basically routing, logical addressing, sender and receivers, IP address. So this is where we start to be IP aware. So if you're, if you're connecting different networks, this is where you're starting to become IP aware, right? Um, and so at this level, this is where you do packets. So this is when we start talking about packets, right? And then once you get up to layer four, layer four is kind of the, the tie that binds, right? It, it ties in the top three layers with, with the bottom three layers, right? It, it's it's, our, it's you know, basically our transport layer at layer four. And we'll talk a little bit about layer four because we do care about it um, because at layer four, this is where we handle, you know, segmentation, you know, flow and error control, those types of things. This is where you might see something like uh, TCP or UDP, right? Transport protocols and those types of things. Um, and so, you know, when you're dealing with this, we're talking about segments. And so from a very high level, again, very high level, we're not digging deep into this. This is the OSI stack from the perspective of what we're talking about today with testing, right? And the reason why this is important to understand is you need to know where you are at in the network. If I'm standing in front of a, a DWDM MUX, if I'm standing in front of a, a, a RJ45 connection, um, you know, or, or different types of things, you know, I have to think to myself, well, what does this mean to me, right? If I'm standing, if it's a fire report to an FTP, then I'm at layer one. Then I, you know, if I'm going to do some sort of test to qualify the signal, then I might look at doing BERT you know, or, or, or something along that line. Because I don't have to worry about frames because I'm the big dumb pipe. I'm just sending bits, you know, to the other end, right? Because uh, I'm, I'm in between this and a switch or whatnot. Uh, if I'm standing in front of a switch and I need to test to another switch, 
then I start being, you know, I, there's more information that I need to get, right? And so, you know, there's, there's several things you need to ask yourself when you're really looking at these networks, right? When you're looking at these networks, there's several things you have to ask yourself. It's like, what am I intestine in front of? You know? Um, and so, is it a switch? Is it a router? Um, do I care about addressing, right? Do I care about any sort of addressing? Meaning, do I need an address to get to the far end? If I have a car and I'm getting on the interstate and there's no exits and there's no entrances, none of that stuff, then I really don't care about addressing, right? I really don't care about addressing uh, because there's only one path. You know, there's only one path. I'm the transport. I get on the interstate. I don't get off. But if there are exits, then I need to know which exit to take, right? So now I care about addressing. I care about addressing. If I'm in a layer two environment, do I need a destination Mac? You know, if I'm in a layer three environment, do I need a destination IP? Do I need a source IP? Those types of information, right? And so that's another thing you have to ask yourself. Am I in an address aware environment? Uh, you would think with RFC 2544 and Y.1564 that you're always in an address aware environment, but that's not necessarily the case, right? A lot of the testing that I see being done today is really at a layer one network across DWDM, you know, between switches and hubs. Uh, because people, you know, a lot of customers and engineers want that information that comes from that, even though there are no frames being interacted with. It's all bits at that point. And so am I in an address aware environment? You have to ask yourself that, right? Um, you know, what is my rate? Because, you know, back in the day when I would test a T1, it was 1.5 megabits per second. That was the rate. That was always the rate. It was either that or not, right? <clears throat> when it comes to Ethernet, it's different. You can have a 10, 100, 1,000 port, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're at 1,000 megs, right? You can be provisioned at 500 megs. And so, you know, what type of port am I testing? Is it optical? Is it electrical? And what rate am I providing across that service to that customer, right? And those are kind of the basic questions you have to ask. <clears throat> Excuse me, ask yourself. I mean, there's obviously other ones, you know, auto-negotiate on, auto-negotiate off, those types of things. But to a very large degree, that's the kind of questions we ask because when you're looking at this network, right, if you're trying to communicate between these two different networks here, um, you know, basically you open up Outlook, it's going to come down, hit the physical layer, come across, and if it's just going to, say, a hub, it's going to do something like this, right? A hub or router or switch, whatever. This is how it looks. So this is how you're testing, right? And so you really need to understand where you are at in the OSI stack um, to really understand how to set up your test application, right? And so hopefully that, that makes a little bit of sense. And, and that's the reason why I talk about that, because this is what we care about. This is what we care about when we're setting up or what we're testing. And to a very large degree, most of our testing is going to be right here, right? It's going to be layer two, layer three stuff. Um, but keep in mind, 2544 and Y.1564 are actually UDP tests. And I'll explain the difference between UDP and TCP at a higher level as well, because again, this is more of a, a basic introduction to, to SLA testing, right? And so if we look <clears throat> at what Ethernet is, right? And um, as I mentioned before, Ethernet was always well, traditional. And I say always. For some people, Ethernet's all they've ever tested, right? So I've been in the telecom industry for, for quite a long time. Uh, so for me, Ethernet is still somewhat new on the, the carrier level side compared to T-Carrier and, and, uh, and other types of services that, that are being provided, right? But Ethernet, you know, when we talk about Ethernet, <clears throat> we need to understand Ethernet frames. So it is very important to understand Ethernet frames. And so the legal Ethernet frame size, you know, to be Ethernet 2 compliant, the legal Ethernet frame size is on the low end 64 bytes, to 1580, right? With VLAN, you add another four bytes in there, but this is the legal Ethernet frame <clears throat> sizes. So every single Ethernet compliant device that you purchase, whether it's at an electronic superstore or whether it's from a enterprise level, uh, you know, network equipment manufacturer, each one of these devices must do full line rate at each one of these, you know, between 64 and 15, 18 bytes without dropping any frames, right? Without having any issues at all. Um, and the SLA testing that we're doing is to make sure that it does that, right? Um, and so, 
looking at an Ethernet frame from a very high level, <clears throat> what you're going to have in the frame is you're going to have some overhead, right? You're going to have, uh, in this particular example, you're going to have uh, a destination MAC address, right? This is where I am going to. Every single network device in the world has a MAC address, and that MAC address is very unique to that particular device. Um, and so if you look at a MAC address, you know, essentially what you, know, what, what you do when you look at a MAC address, you're going to have, oh, you know, we'll say 00 0.0301, you know, et cetera, et cetera, whatever, right? Um, and so this first portion here, so, you know, th this, the, the first portion here, this belongs to that particular manufacturer, right? So this belongs to that particular manufacturer. And um, so X, all of the XFO devices have their own MAC address. In fact, when I start up a test set later, you'll see that we have a specific MAC address for that device. And all of our devices are going to be exactly, you know, the same uh, when it comes to that. And, um, and, and, and so when we look at that, so that's the MAC address for the manufacturer. And this second portion here is reserved for the manufacturer to assign to that particular device, right? And so <clears throat> it, it's almost like, a, it's, it's almost like a, a serial number for that specific device is what it is. Um, and so um, that's MAC addresses from a very high level, right? Let me get rid of this right here. And so when we start looking back at the, uh, the Ethernet frame here, we have a destination MAC address, and then we also have a source MAC address. So the source being where did it come from? And that would be coming from, for our purposes here, from our test set going to uh, a specific port on a switch you know, in the network, right? So this is basically, where am I coming from? Where am I going to? That's addressing, right? <clears throat> As you get higher up the stack, the source IP, destination IP, you know, you know um, um, those types of things, right? And so um, as we start again to look at the, um, you know, the different portions of the Ethernet frame, you know, we also have like the type. If there's a VLAN in here, there'll be like a, a four byte, you know, a four byte VLAN in there. And so type could be, you know, UDP, TCP, whatever. Uh, and then you also have the actual data payload. This is what you're paying for as a customer. This is where my information is at, right? Is within the payload. And then you'll have some sort of error checking, frame check some CRC at, at the end of it, right? And so the point here is there are predefined overhead byte allocations for every single Ethernet frame. You must have six bytes dedicated to destination, six bytes to source, you know, two to the type, et cetera, et cetera, right? The only thing that is scalable is the payload. <clears throat> so depending on your frame size will depend on the amount of payload that you're transmitting down the actual path, right? And so if I was doing 64 bytes, if I had 64 byte frames, these are super tiny frames, I'm only gonna have about, you know, 46 bytes of payload, not a lot of information. If I had 1518, then I would have 1500 bytes of information, right? And so that's what's scalable when it comes to frame sizes. And for most traffic that travels down the internet, that's the frame sizes that we see. So if you're using voice over IP, you'll use a very small frame size, like 107 bytes or so, right? Depending on the codec. And the reason for that is if you have any sort of frame loss and frame loss exists in the cloud, right? In the internet, across the world, across, you know, the countries, there's, there's retransmissions all the time. There's retransmissions right now as I'm doing this, right? Um, and so stuff like this happens. And, and so with voice over IP, if you drop a frame, you don't want a huge frame size because it'll affect the call quality, you know, massively. If I was using a very large frame size for voice over IP and I dropped that frame, I would lose three seconds of conversation, right? Like a noticeable performance issue on your network or the quality of the services, right? So use small frame sizes. If you want to be very bandwidth, bandwidth efficient and get data over quickly and efficiently, then use a larger frame size, right? And so for a lot of us that work within um, the actual communications networks, especially if you're working on carrier level, enterprise level stuff, um, we're using a lot of jumbo or giant frames, right? And these are frame sizes that are over 
1518, right? Over 1518. So for example, here, um, let's say that I had a larger frame size. So I'm gonna go in here and increase this one. So right now, this frame size right here is between 64 and 1518, right? The legal frame size. This is, this is the, the size of this particular frame. But if I were to get in here and increase this frame size, right? So I'm gonna go in here and increase this frame size significantly. So we'll get in here and do that. And so now, all of a sudden, my frame is larger, right? So we're looking at this right here. My frame is quite a bit larger. But the thing is, if you, if, if you look at the overhead itself, it really hasn't changed that much at all, right? It really hasn't changed that much. It's still about the same size. And so um, we're still allocating this four bytes here to there. But now, all of a sudden, my allocation of payload changes significantly, right? And so I still have six bytes of destination. I still have six bytes of source, the type of payload, the frame checks on CRC, it's always gonna be that size for those, uh, for that portion of the overhead. So every single frame must have overhead. And so when I do an actual test, I'll show you frames per second and you'll see how efficient it is for, for bandwidth efficiency to do larger frame sizes. So let's say in this example here, you know, we're using 9,000 bytes, right? And so now our frame size is much, much larger. So this is a jumbo frame. 9,000 is a fairly common frame size that we see for enterprise services, particularly for financial institutions, because it is very efficient use of bandwidth. But on the downside, it's a lot of traffic. So if the frames drop, then it's really gonna impact your network. And this is why we do the SLA testing is to qualify for these different frame sizes. And this is why I talk about the OSI stack. This is why I talk about frames and frame sizes because it's important to understand why you're doing this testing from a very high level, right? Um, if you're working on a car, if you turn the key and there's no sound, there's no clicking, it's just silence, then you might have a power issue. It might be your battery, right? <clears throat> and so understanding the basics of how something works is incredibly important. So understanding that we have different frame sizes and these different frame sizes will impact our network in different and unique ways is important. And it's one of the main reasons why we do SLA testing. And so we do SLA testing for legal Ethernet frame sizes to make sure that that device complies, right? And then we do it for jumbo and giant frames because we wanna make sure that if we are delivering to a customer a circuit that we promise you know, to support jumbo frames, we need to be able to make sure that every single device between you <clears throat> and your customer supports that jumbo frame. So in this case here, it's 9,000 bytes, right? Um, and so one way to put this into perspective, um, there's different ways to transport traffic, small frames, large frames, right? And <clears throat> you know, as it relates to frame sizes. And so let's say that I had 100 frames that I needed to get from my location to a warehouse across town. One way I can get those 100 frames there or 100 packages, right? One way we can get that, those 100 packages to that specific location is basically to, um, uh, you know, one way to do it is, because remember every single package or frame must have overhead. Where am I going to, where am I coming from? So it needs its own driver, right? So I can take those 100 packages and give them to 100 drivers for them to deliver. But every driver takes up bandwidth. So it's very inefficient use of bandwidth, right? or I can take those 100 packages and put them into one truck with one driver. Very efficient use of bandwidth. And so, of course, there's different complexities with small frames versus small, right? When you have small frames, it's a, your, your frames per second is massive. So, you know, you see that light flashing like crazy on the switch. Every single frame must be acknowledged and read and checked and closed back up, right? Um, and, and so it's very important to understand that, that that's part of what we're, you know, the frame sizes. Of course, large frame sizes, when they drop, that's a lot of information that needs to be retransmitted, right? So if those 100 packages with 100 drivers and one of them, you know, has an accident and needs to re-deliver the package, it's only a little bit of information, right? So it doesn't really chew up any of the additional bandwidth on the retransmissions as much. And so when we're doing SLA testing, we're, we're trying to confirm, hey, how do these different frame sizes react to our network? 
how is my network handling 10 gig line, line rate at 64 bytes, right? Is, is, is it handling that type of bursty, fast traffic, you know, that way? Um, and so that's basically what, you know, when I talk about Ethernet, that's what I talk about, right? Is understanding that that's what Ethernet is all about. Um, when we're talking about the SLA testing, obviously there's a whole heck of a lot more. We could do a whole two weeks on, on just Ethernet, right? <clears throat> um, another thing that's important to understand, and I like to talk about this because one of the big issues that I see is when, you know, we as service providers, many of us that work with service providers and network equipment manufacturers, um, we're providing a service to a customer. If you're doing SLA testing, you are providing a service to a customer, whether it's internal or external. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes that customer uses whatever application to verify their bandwidth. So most of us at a residential home will get in there and do a speed test. So you might go to speedtest.net. You might run Ookla, whatever. A lot of those tests are TCP-based tests. A lot of us working from home really care about TCP. A lot of the services that we rely on are TCP-based, right? And so TCP is basically guaranteed traffic. It's your email. I'm going to get 100% of my data. If you, want to get, if you need to get 100% of your data, you will use TCP, right? Um, because TCP will do retransmissions. There's acknowledgments and syncs going back and forth. Not going to get deep into you know the you know how it works, but basically TCP is guaranteed traffic. If a if a packet drops, the far end is going to say, "Hey, I didn't get that," and it's going to the the source end is going to retransmit, right? <clears throat> so we will retransmit data. You'll get hundred percent of the data at the expense of time, and so that's kind of the critical thing when you look at TCP. TCP is guaranteed traffic, but if I need to wait for that package, so I have my 100 frames, 100 packets, 100 packages being transmitted. One of them breaks down and drops, right? The far end is an email. It's trying to get this email or Word doc together, and it's, emitting, it's missing a bit of the information. With TCP, you will retransmit that information. Retransmits means I have to resend the package which takes time. Retransmissions adds to time, right? Because I have to resend the package. You order something from an online uh, uh, store and it doesn't show up, they're going to have to resend it, which takes more time, right? And if you think about bandwidth, it's 10 megabits per second time, right? And so this is what we're talking about time. When you retransmit time, so TCP, you'll get 100% of the information at the expense of time or bandwidth. Where UDP is best effort stuff, right? This is best effort. Uh, this is uh, connectionless. <clears throat> so we're not retransmitting anything. So what would you use UDP for? Well, a lot of transport is UDP. Um, you know, delivering information back and forth because... We do these SLA testings to ensure that we're not dropping any frames, right? So that's UDP. Uh, voice over IP, because you don't retransmit voice because it's real time. So anytime we're real time services, voice over IP, uh, live streaming, IPTV, those types of things. So if, if you ever watch TV and it starts to tile or chop, that's because it's UDP. We're not retransmitting that. That's missing information. That's drop packets. That's drop frames. That's information that never showed up. And so obviously you don't want to use that for email because you don't want part of the Word document or part of the email. And so that's UDP. The reason why I talk about this is RFC 2544 and Y.1564 um, are UDP test because we're testing the transport, right? That's primarily what we're doing to a very large degree. Um, well, I mean, obviously there's some client, there's client side, a lot of client side stuff, but but transporting to the client side as well. And so it's UDP testing. Um, so if you have a customer that calls and says, hey, I'm only getting, you know, 26 megabits of my bandwidth. I'm only getting 26 megabits of my bandwidth, but my CIR or, or committed information rate, my contractual rate is 50. Why am I not getting it? Keep in mind that a lot of customers are testing TCP, if they're using something like speedtest.net, right? 
while you might be testing, if you're using RFC 2544 or Y.5064, UDP. Um, and so, you know, this is basically what's happening. And so um, to give one example of this, years ago, I actually worked on a circuit and, uh, and it was between, basically it was outside of St. Louis. So it was outside of St. Louis. So let's say that, you know, I had a location just outside of St. Louis here. Um, and mid span, it went to Little Rock. And so if you're not familiar with the United States, I mean, basically these are just, you know, cities, right? Um, they are pretty far apart. And so essentially what I had was I had a test set, right? So I had a test set that I was testing with. Um, um, actually, the customer had it, had one of our test sets, and they called me. And so essentially they were testing a circuit between St. Louis. It was going through Little Rock and ending up way down in New Iberia, Louisiana. So we'll just say, you know, uh, Louisiana, right? Um, and this is a long distance. This is hundreds and hundreds of miles, right? So this customer in Louisiana was a bank. And they were, they had purchased a 50 meg Ethernet circuit from one of their offices in St. Louis to one of their offices in Louisiana. And so the CIR, or committed information rate, was 50 megabits per second. This is what was sold to the customer. When the customer tested their network, they were getting 26 megabits per second, right? Megabits per second. This is what they were getting. Um, and so, you know, obviously, you know, nowhere near or close to what it should be, right? So my customer went out there with one of our test sets and ran a 2544 test. So they ran RFC 2544, which we'll talk about exactly what it does, you know, throughput, latency, whatnot. They did a throughput test, and on the throughput test, they were getting 48.5 megabits per second, right? So my customer called me and said, well, we tested it at 48.5 megabits. The customer's getting 26. There's something wrong with their test. And I said, no, RC 2544 will adjust the throughput to maximum throughput with no frame loss. So there is no frame loss at 48.5 megabits. It's a UDP test. We're not retransmitting. So it's going to scale back until it has maximum throughput with no frame loss. And that's 48.5 megabits. Your network is expecting 50. So you're, you're pushing 50 megs down, you know, 50 meg, you know, uh, of, of Ethernet down the, the transport. But it's only accepting 48 and a half, which means you're dropping frames, which means you're retransmitting. And so what was happening was, of course, the customer is trying to get 100% of their data. And as I mentioned before, to get 100% of their data, they have to retransmit. And that takes time, right? So that takes time, which drops their bandwidth. And so that's what was happening there. So the quick fix was to rate limit the customer down to 45 megs. So they logged into the switches, set a policy, put in rate, you know, rate limiting to 45 megs. And then the customer was happy at that point because then they were getting over 35 megs of bandwidth, right? And they were more content with that. Obviously, they still had to fix the problem. Uh, to a large degree, a lot of the problems usually on the customer side, right, or on the server side or the application side. In this example, it wasn't. What was happening in this particular example, just to kind of complete the story, is in Little Rock, they had to go through another provider, right? Because when a circuit travels across the country or across the world, it rarely stays on the same network, right? It goes over to another provider. And here, this provider took it and put it into an STS-1. So they used an STS-1 to transport that circuit across their network. And an STS-1 is a 45 meg payload, actually, theoretically, 48.5. And so that was the problem, was they were choked in the middle of their network. So, of course, that had to be fixed to get the customer back to the CIR that they were testing. And so this is why it's important to understand TCP and UDP. You might get different results because you're doing slightly different tests. So you have to keep that in mind and understand that, right? Um, there are staple TCP tests. Uh, R3, you know, RC6349 is, is, is the common one now, which is stateful TCP testing. So you can do stateful TCP testing to have much more of a customer experience test, right? And so this leads us into our actual testing. RFC 2544, 
So RFC 2544 is not necessarily a standard. It's more of a spec. Um, you know, basically what happens is some network equipment manufacturers got together, some uh, um, different uh, test providers, some, you know, uh, service providers, whomever, got together and decided to come up with a test spec for certain devices. And it was actually, it was actually designed, it's actually designed for production testing. It wasn't really designed for network testing. So when switch manufacturers were building a switch, they needed some way to test it on the factory floor, right? Before they shipped it to make sure that it was working properly and that, that was able to push all the frame sizes down there, right? So it, <clears throat> it had to be able to do that. And so to do that, they created this test spec. Um, and so the different applications here, or the test that it looks at, is basically throughput, which is, you know, the one that we talk about the most. And this is like the number of frames that can be transmitted without any errors. Bit in, bit out, right? That's basically throughput. You know, simplify. It does back-to-back, -back, which is often disabled during network testing. And, you know, back-to-back -back is, you know, the number of... Uh, Transmitted frames, a full line rate before a frame is lost, right? It's like a burstability test. You know, that's, that's, that's basically what back-to-back -back is, right? You know, the maximum frame rate, uh, transmitted frame rate at various frame sizes. Uh, and then frame loss, which is kind of the inverse of throughput, you know? So how many frames didn't make it there? So frame loss rate, frame loss percentage, that's what we're looking at. And then the last one is latency. And latency in this world is basically round-trip delay. Right? How long did it take to get there and back? These are the four tests that are provided when doing RFC 60, uh, I'm sorry, RFC 2544, right? And it's done at a seven frame distribution. So if you're gonna comply to RFC, it's a seven frame distribution, you know, and it starts at 64 bytes and it works its way up to 1518. So all the legal ethernet frame sizes. When we set up a test, you'll see the, the seven different frame sizes. Um, so the thing about RFC that's interesting is I mentioned it's really more for production testing and not network testing, although probably 90% of network testing for SLA today is using RFC 2544 because when Ethernet hit, you know, the, the world, when Ethernet hit the world, um, test manufacturers really didn't have an application for network testing, but they did have an application for production testing, right, that they sold to network equipment manufacturers, and that was 2544. And so they took 2544, you know, and used it for network testing. And the reason why it's not the most ideal way to do network testing is just because of the way it does it, right? Um, it's almost like a, like a big stress tester um, to oversimplify it. Essentially what it does is it actually steps through the testing. It'll start at throughput at 64 bytes, and then it'll go to full line rate and check to see if there's, you know, what the throughput is, what the, you know, um, and then measure it. Then it'll do the back-to-back -back test, check for burstability at 64 bytes. Then it'll do only frame loss. And then it'll come back and only do latency. So it's a very step-by-step -step testing, a very controlled testing, which is what you expect in production testing, right? Um, and so it'll step all the way through and complete the test. So you're not doing throughput the whole time. You're only doing throughput at that one moment, right? You're only measuring throughput at that one time. And of course, everything, you know, these, these four different key performance indicators are really, you know, they're all very symbiotic. It, it, one affects the other, right? <clears throat> and so if you're having latency problems, it's gonna affect your throughput. Um, so you wanna measure all these things at once. So this is one of the issues with 2544, is it is limited to this. Uh, another limitation is if you, run it, if you wanted to run a 24 hour test, back when I used to work on transport and I was doing an OC192 test, back in the early days, we're doing 72 hour BERT. We'd run a BERT for 72 hours. 24 hours, depending on the type of services or the SLAs that we provide our customers. If you try to do that with RC 2544, you could tweak the settings, um, but it would run throughput for eight hours and then back to back for six hours, whatever, right? So it'd be a step-by-step -step test. You can make it run 24 hours, but it's not really a 24-hour test, right? Um, if you're set up RFC the way the spec is designed, I think it runs, I think it takes like four hours. Most folks just, you know, set it very simple. It runs 15 minutes and then they tear it down, right? So we'll run a test and I'll show you how that works. But this is essentially what RFC does. So you can see there's some limitations here. One of the big ones 
is where is our friend Jitter? Right? Or probably not a friend, right? Um, and Jitter is basically the, you know, the variations in the packet flow, right? Uh, contributes heavily to out-of-sequence packets and whatnot. So we're not measuring Jitter. We're not measuring out-of-sequence packets because packets need to get there. Frames need to get there in order, right? And so, um, and as you know, when we look at a network, when we look at a huge network, and you know, we're talking about the cloud here, right? If you have different switches and devices all across a region, a world, whatever, and these devices are all connected, you know, it, it's, it's not necessarily just a ring, right? It's more of a mesh infrastructure that we have today, right? And so, <clears throat> you know, this is what your network might look like over hundreds of miles, over thousands of miles, right? And so when you're transmitting a packet, a, pi a piece of information that needs to go from this location over to this location, this is the path of least resistance here, right? But then all of a sudden, on this particular server right here, there's congestion for whatever reason. You have congestion, you know, congestion for whatever reason. It starts to have resources issues. So your information is going to reroute around it. Now, we're, now, of course, we're talking about the internet more than anything else, right? Your information will reroute around it. And so now some of your frames went this direction. Some of your other frames are now going this direction, right? And so depending on the delay variations and whatnot, they can be out of sequence. And so these are the types of things that need to be measured, right? Again, part of the SLAs and, and, and whatnot. And so, and so when we look at RFC 2544, that is kind of some of the limitations there, right? That's kind of some of the limitations. And so uh, I'm going to set up a quick RFC 2544 test so we can talk about some of the stuff that we uh, mentioned here, addressing and whatnot. And so I have uh, networked into my computer here. I have a test set. So this particular test set is an FTB1 Pro. And the module in it, this particular module is a... FTBX 8880. So this one will do uh, DS1 to OC192, uh, 10 meg Ethernet to 10 gig Ethernet, right? We have 100 gig e versions and whatnot, but this is a particular one that I have networked in. And so um, it'll do a lot of different types of testing, the Sonnet testing and whatnot that we talked about, but we are going to do 2544. And essentially all I have here um, is, I'm just looped back. It's, it's, there's nothing fancy here. In fact, uh, I'm going to be bold here. I got to, I got to, a mobile webcam here. So uh, excuse the, the mess of my, my temporary office here. I'm a woodworker, so I'm building a new desk. But basically what I have here is, is the FTB1 platform, right? And all I've done is loop back the SFP. So I, I, have, a, I, have, a 10, you know, I have a 10 gig SFP that's essentially loop back um, on the device itself, right? So I have, I have this 10 gig SFP that's loop back. So let me, uh, let me switch back to my getting fancy here. Let me switch back to my presentation here. So I essentially have this 10 gig E SFP loop back onto itself. And so from the main screen here, um, what we have here is, is our main interface for RC2544. And over here to the left, this is essentially um, kind of our, our, um, our physical portion of it, right? This is our interface. And right now it's set for 10, 100, 1000. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify the structure because I, I have a 10 gig Ethernet SFP plus, right? Um, and so when we're looking at this, I'm going to drop this down to 10 gig LAN because that's what I have, single port. We're not going to get too deep into it. Most testing today is just single port. Uh, it'll either be to a hard loop, which we have to be careful of because you only do a layer one loop if there's no addressing involved, right? Because you don't want to cross a, you know, a broadcast storm or something like that. Um, or you'll run to some sort of, sort of smart device and so you have to keep that in mind, and I'll talk about that. So basically, I set it for 10 gig Ethernet, and you can already see quickly that we have Link, Linky Link. I've been trying to get the, you know, the, the, the company to add uh, a little guy with a sword there, like it's Zelda or something, but that's not happening. Uh, but, but essentially, we have Link, and then there's our power value, right? We're coming in at neg 5.4 dBm, right? And so that tells us a lot. Receiver sensitivity, you know, am I coming within the power levels? Am I transmitting within the power levels of my network, right, for receivers? So that's more of a layer one issue. And so we have that set. So if I expand that first window there, you know, this allows us to set up our source information, right? So we can see our power range in here. You know, um, in, in this particular situation, it's between neg, you know, neg 14.4 to 0.5 dBm. 
If you fall outside of that, this won't be green anymore. It'll, it'll turn yellow, then it'll turn red, right? Um, and so, you know, frequency offsets, all that fun stuff. Um, if, if you're doing electrical, obviously you're going to have, uh, you know, um, duplex, half duplex, those types of questions that you'll have. But also down here in the bottom left, network. Am I in an address where environment? Well, yes, I am. And so if I am in an address where environment, in this particular situation, I really am not because it's a layer one loop. Uh, but we'll say that we're going through a switch just so we, so we can talk about that, right? And so this is where I can set up my, my source information. So this right here is my source MAC address. So this is my source MAC address here. And you, you typically want to stick with factory default so that way you don't have, uh, um, you know, duplicate MAC addresses, which is, which is not good, right? And so this is my MAC address. This first portion is XFO. This sex, this, uh, this, uh, so all XFO MAC addresses start with this. Every single one of our test sets start with this. And then this, this, this second portion is this basically the MAC serial number for this particular device, right? Um, and so this is my source MAC address. A lot of people will often... Um, take this source MAC address and label it on the front of their test sets. Because if you're working with uh, a, a network engineer, they'll often log into the test set or log into the switch to look for that MAC address on the MAC table to make sure that you're plugged into the right device. And so this is where you'll input that information. If you're doing any sort of VLAN tagging, which we didn't talk much about, it's another way to address. VLANs are basically, it creates virtual LANs within your network, right? It puts a particular port into a, its own broadcast domain, so it, the traffic's isolated. It's how a lot of traffic is managed. Every single cell site might have its own VLAN. Every single uh, you know, type of service, you know, your voice over IP might have its own VLAN and given a higher priority because it doesn't retransmit, right? And so VLANs are a very important way to control, prioritize, and shape traffic, right? It's also used for redundancy purposes, for protection service. It's, VLANs have really uh, gone, you know, come quite a ways. And if there's a VLAN associated to that port, then you need to put a VLAN ID there. So we support Q and Q. So you know, VLAN within a VLAN within a VLAN. Um, so inner tags, outer tags stuff, you would have to put a VLAN in there. So this is why addressing is important to understand, right? Um, and so if I had a VLAN tag, I'd put it in there and plug it in. VLAN 201. So that allows me to test within that particular isolated traffic domain, right? Um, it's also important to make sure on this last tab here that you have the appropriate SFP. So mine does support 10 gig ethernet. There it is in the top left. And essentially, we're just setting up a test. So we've set up our source information. So within that ethernet frame, this is our source information. Now we need to set up where it's going to, right? If it's a layer one loop like I have here, then we don't really care about it, right? It just, just make sure that the, the destination MAC address is resolved, right? So in this case here, if you look at it, I have my source MAC address and my destination MAC address is the same because I'm loop back onto myself. But I have resolved, so I'm happy, you know? So I'm good here. Uh, if I was testing to a centralized test head, I could put the MAC address of that centralized test head to test to it, right? Uh, if I had an IP address and not a MAC address, I can put in the IP address and then resolve the MAC. So basically, we're ARPing for the MAC address, right? In this case here, I'm resolved. Everything's happy to go. So now I'm, I'm linked to my port. I, am, I have my source and destination information. So I'm talking through the switch and across the network. And then if I go to RFC 2544 here, these are the tests I can run. So I'm, I'm not going to run all four tests for the sake of time. I'm just going to run throughput because I really want to show you something. We can do a dual test set. So if you have another XFO unit, whether it's a BV3100 from Bricks, which is actually XFO, or another one of our test sets, we can actually do dual test sets to that, right? We can also send up loop up commands uh, and respond to loop, loop up commands to a lot of third party test equipment. So if you have another third party test equipment and you were to send a loop command to us, we would loop. You know, we would initiate a smart loop, right? And so in this case here, I'm just going to do throughput. I almost always turn off my pass-fail verdict unless I know it, because I don't want to fail showing up in my report. I want raw values in this particular installation uh, situation. Um, I usually also set my, my rates usually to um, actual line rate speeds instead of percentage. And so in this case here, so here are the seven RFC distribution frame sizes, right, that we talked about. They're right here. So that's what we talk about there. I'm only going to do two. 
because of the sake of time, right? Because we're getting down to the wire here. And so I'm going to do only two, a small and a large. And I'm going to do one at 64 and then one at 9,000. So a very small frame size and an incredibly jumbo size, right? Uh, and I'm going to do it at full line rate. So if I go to the subtest here, I'm going to do it at a full 10 gig rate. And I'm going to run this test. And it's going to be a, a fairly quick test, right? So I'm going to loop it back onto itself and run it. Because I want to tie in a lot of the stuff we talked about, right? Again, this is the basics of 2544 and Y.1564. And really, the important thing for this testing isn't necessarily where everything is at in the GUI, right? Because you might not have this test set. Uh, it's important to understand that it's, it, you know, how to set it up, what's important to know. You know, what, why is it important to test multiple frame sizes? Why is it important to know if I'm in an address where environment, if I need a VLAN? Because you don't want to spend a lot of time on the phone with, you know, your support or your, your test center trying to find a loop. Um, and the reason why is because you don't have the test set up right. You don't have the, des the right destination information. So all of that kind of stuff, right? So in this case here, it runs a quick test. And again, we're only doing throughput. And that was quick, right? So if you look at it, so if you look at this right now, this is at 64 bytes, we have full line rate. At 9,000 bytes, we have full line rate. This is what we expect because we're at layer one. This right here, this all means, what is it at at all layers, layer one? That's what, the, that's what the throughput is. At layer two, we're adding overhead, right? We're adding our drivers, our source and destination information, that kind of stuff. That's layer two. At layer two, here's the bandwidth now. Look at that. 64 megs drops way down to 7.6 gigs. This is usable bandwidth. The rest is overhead, right? If I go to layer three, this is what it looks like. At layer three, whoops, at layer three, um, 9,000 bytes still has really good efficient bandwidth here. It's still 9.9 .9 gigs. Because remember, we don't have as much overhead. We don't have as many drivers. Uh, we're 64 bytes, we're, we're almost down to 50% of usable bandwidth. Because so much of our bandwidth is occupied by overhead. And to really put this into perspective, I'm gonna put this back to layer one, and I'm gonna change it from megabits per second to frames per second. And this is how many frames we're transmitting every second. So at 64 megs, oh, I'm not gonna do the math, that's, you know, uh, what is it? 14.8 uh, million frames per second. That's, and every frame has overhead, uses bandwidth. Where at 9,000 bytes, we're roughly 14,000, uh, or 140,000, right? So far less frames. So much more bandwidth efficient. So you need to test your network to make sure that you can handle small frames, you can handle large frames because they have their own complications within the network, right? And so that's RFC 2544. And if you're to look at Y.1564, Y.1564 is completely different in the way that it does testing. So Y.1564 um, essentially uh, is a standard testing. So it is an ITU standard. It was actually originally developed by Expo as an application that we provided our customers as an alternative to 2544. And then ITU took over and now it belongs to the standards body. And you know they've done their magic to it and, and changed it around. But essentially, Y.1564 is the standardized way to do SLA testing that is supposed to replace 2544 to a large degree, right? because it fills in the gaps that 2544 has. So Y.1564, essentially Y.1564, you know, there's certain things that it does. Um, and so when we're looking at the network in, in general, um, you know, when you're looking at uh, Y.1564, or, or networks in general, right, they're very chaotic. You know, and you know, they're bursty. They're not just doing 64 bytes in that minute, right? You know, Skype is using this, Outlook is using this. These different applications are using different types of frame sizes. And so if you look at, you know, these different types of applications um, and how chaotic and bursty they are, this is what our, the Y.1564 is supposed to answer. First of all, it provides jitter, which is what we need. It looks at out of sequence. Uh, it much more robust uh, QoS, COS type of testing, so differentiated services, VLAN priorities. MEF stuff, whatever. Uh, and it allows you to do multiple services or frame sizes simultaneously, right? 
So I can get in here, and luckily with our test set, once we have one test set up, the other ones will set up as well. So I can get in here and set up a test. In this situation, I'll say, you know, I'm gonna set up two tests, two services, one at 64 bytes, and then one at uh, using eMix. eMix is basically kind of round robin uh, frames. So this particular one, I probably have it doing five different frame sizes. So it'll step through these five different frame sizes, which is pretty cool, right? So, you know, I, I can theoretically do 10 services doing eMix. So just throwing a bunch of different frame sizes at your network. Um, I can have some of it bursty. So if I'm doing CBS, EBS testing, so looking for, you know, CIR uh, compliance and stuff like that for burstiness, I can do that, right? I can send it to different IP addresses. I can give it different VLAN priorities, um, whatever. And so in this case here, I have these two enabled. And essentially, all I'm going to do is just I'm going to, you know, start a test. Um, and so it sets up very similarly, right? And basically, what you want to do is you want to determine what services do I want to test? What frame sizes? I often use eight. I'll do the seven RFC frame sizes, and then I'll do one jumbo, a 9,000 or whatever, right? I mean, obviously, in a network that can handle 9,000 bytes. Uh, and it goes in there, and if you look at it, it goes in there and does a service configuration test. So it goes in there to verify, can I even do this test at these different service sizes, right? So it does that first. Uh, and so it spends a little bit of time doing that. It checks for policing to see if it's, you know, if there's, uh, if you have extended information rate. So CR is committed information rate. That is the contractual rate you sell your customer. Extended information rate is kind of that buffer that you add in there for burstiness. So if you're selling a 50 meg circuit, you might allow extension up to 55 or 60 megs, right? So the traffic can burst or go up to that rate. It gives you a better average on the, on the max bandwidth too. Um, and you can check for policing. Because uh, RFC 2544 doesn't really do that. RFC 2544 will go to max rate. And if it doesn't work, it'll go to 50%. So it'll keep trying to have until it finds max rate. And then it'll go, oh, 48.5 with no frame loss and stick to that, right? Where this will go to your CIR, and then if you have it checked for policing, you can say, okay, go in there and can I do more than the, the, the provisioned rate? Yes. How much more? Ooh, my, I don't have my traffic shaping on. I don't have my, you know, policy on or something like that. So it'll allow you to do that. And <clears throat> once it's actually running the actual service performance test, you'll be able to measure frame loss, jitter, latency, uh, throughput, all at the exact same time, as opposed to stepped. So if you, run a, if you do want to run a 24-hour burn-in test, you can do that. And it'll measure all the KPIs or key performance indicators at the same time, right? And so it's much more indicative of what your network can do. It's a lot better way to qualify for uh, your, your, your priorities, your QoS, those types of things. And, and so once it's running the test, you know, you'll see it right now, it's running the service performance test. And you, and you see we have a fail. And we have a fail here because my excess, my EIR, I've gone above my extended rate. I have one of these set for 4.5 gigs CIR and 5 gigs EIR. And I was able to get 10 gigs over the EIR, right? Or I was able to go to 10 gigs, which is over the EIR, which is why I got that fail there. So if I go to the service performance test here, we're reading it. So I got 50% of, I got, you know, 45% uh, percent of the traffic on one service. And then on eMix, I got the other 50% of the traffic, right? So I can sit there and I can let this run for however long I have the test. I can get in here, look at, are there any out of sequence, frame loss, metrics, whatnot, and there's loggers. And so this is a much more indicative way to test, right? And so, um, so RFC, 20, RFC 2544 is still being used heavily because that's what a lot of things are set to, right? Um, and so this is what a lot of things are set to right now is, is RFC 2544. And so um, when you're looking at, you know, these different tests here, this is what it looks like. So all the out-of-sequence stuff, all of the jitter, the rates, you know, whatnot, um, it's, you know, you're able to see it all at once. And so this is why we're starting to see more of a shift to Y.1564. It is standards-based. And so you always have that to rely on, right? Because that's where the industry is going. And, and to really kind of finish this before I, you know, start looking at some of the questions here, we do have one test application that really simplifies Y.1564 because Y.1564 is incredibly powerful, right? It is incredibly powerful. Um, so you have a lot of different ways to set it up. The good news is you can set up a really complex test and save the configuration and just load that configuration and maybe change an IP address or a MAC address or something like that. 
But we have a tool called ISAM, which is Intelligent Service Activation Methodology, which is basically brought out 1564 um, with a little bit more intelligent. We, we tend to do that with a lot of our applications. We have an OTDR, then we have an intelligent OTDR, the IOLM, right? Uh, we have RF over CIPRI to so look at your RF, you know, over the, the CIPRI link. Then we have IORF, which is the intelligent version of it, right? So we have a lot of intelligent applications that we develop uh, to really assist our end users. And ISAM is one of them. So ISAM essentially is Y.1564, but it allows you to do some, uh, you know, you can configure it with, with Y.1564, but, you know, we have some pre-canned configurations that allow you to do uh, best effort testing, like really quick MEF type of testing, right? So if I wanted to go in here and say, hey, I want to test two services. So let's say I'm going to test two services, at layer two. I can do layer three and layer four. I want to test two services. On one of them, I want it to be best effort traffic. On the other one, I want it to be prioritized, right? You can also set up up to 25 user profiles. And so I can get in here and then configure these different ways, you know, different frame classifications, different types of VLAN prioritization, um, you know, MEF specs, you know, whatever. And so it allows you to quickly set it up. And if you wanted to run a stateful TCP test on top of it, so you go in and run a UDP test, and then if you want to run a stateful TCP test on top of it, you can hit that selection here on the bottom, right? You can say, hey, I want to do a, a 6349 as well. In this case, we're not because I, I would need a far end responder. And then, you know, the type of loop. Is it a manual loop, physical loop? Is it a remote loop, means some sort of smart back device? A smart loop back device is a device on the far end that swaps the source and destination MAC address, right? So when you send the test frame to that device, it'll open that test frame, flip the source and MAC, the source and destination, put it back together so it knows how to get back, right? It's like a GPS. You get there, then you, then you reverse your addressing and you come back home, right? In this case here, I got a manual loop. And so, um, and of course, you know, it, it's just gonna do a multicast to find my, uh, my, my MAC address. Um, and so basically I just run a test. So it's much more, it's much more of a simplified way to do Y.1564 because the full blown application is incredibly powerful, but for some it can be a little bit intimidating, right? So this is a quick way to do the exact same kind of testing. Um, and so that's kind of in a nutshell, that's kind of the way that I like to present the two applications. I know I don't spend a lot of time within the actual application. I think it's a lot more incredibly important um, to really understand the reasons why you're using these applications to test, right? Um, what sort of information you need to have to configure a test appropriately and why are you doing these, you know, these, these different types of tests, right? And so, you know, look, you know, looking at some of the questions here, uh, let me see what I got here. Um, so somebody asked um, the soak time, right? So this is a question, it's interesting to me because a lot of Ethernet testing that I see out in the field with my customers is an incredibly fast test. It, it's almost like, I remember back when I was turning up low bit rate services, T1s and whatnot, you know, I would set up a, a stress pattern. I'd inject a couple of errors, bit errors, I'd watch it come back and I'd tear it down, right? Or I might let it run 30 minutes. Um, but really didn't let it run a long time. But for high bitrate stuff, I was doing 24 hours. I was doing, you know, 72 hours. Um, I'm not seeing tests being run as long in, in a lot of areas that I'm working. Now, of course, this is very regional. I, I imagine in other parts of the world uh, with certain specific companies, it's different. So really, I'm a big fan of 24 hour burning, right? For high capacity stuff. Obviously, if you're turning up a residential service, a low bit rate, enterprise customers, SLAs, you know, you're not going to tie up a test equipment for 24 hours on every single Ethernet circuit. We would love that as a test set provider, but that's just not happening, right? And so, but on critical circuits, I, I love the idea of 24 hours, right? Because that's really, you know, you can burn in your optics. You can, you know, see what it looks like over time, uh, you know, those types of things, right? Um, and so for high bit rate critical traffic, I like 24 hours, right? 72 hours is a little bit long. Um, the longest I've ever seen, this is a true story, was 30 days. There's a, there's a lot of story behind that, but that's, that's kind of the longest thing that I've seen. Um, and so another thing that somebody mentioned, I didn't talk about it much here because I was doing a 10 gig Ethernet test, is when you're setting up your, your interface. So somebody's asking about auto negotiation, right? So, and this, this happens a lot with electrical circuits. So auto negotiate is basically a function within the switch that you can enable on the port to automatically negotiate the rate you know, duplex, full duplex, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, the interface speed. If auto, if auto negotiate is on the switch, then you must turn it on in the test set. 
And that's one of the biggest issues that we run into to maintain or, or get that original link is, is, is auto-negotiate. And sometimes if you're doing tests from two testers on either end, <laughs> one's toggling it on, one's toggling it off, you got to make sure if, if it's on the network, you have to have it on the test set. If it's off on the network, then turn it off on your test set, right? Um, and and that's, that's probably one of the biggest problems because when it comes to testing, the first thing I want to do is I want to get link. And, and link, you know, it, it's normally pretty simple, right? So when I plug into a switch, if it's optical, I get power. If the power is within my receiver sensitivity, we get link, right? Uh, well, it lights up. It doesn't, you know, that just means that we're negotiated with the port, right? We're negotiated with the port as far as speed goes. That doesn't mean we're talking to the switch necessarily. That doesn't mean we're talking to the network. We're just talking to the port. That's your original link, right? And so once you get onto the Mac table, if it's a switch, then you're talking to the switch. And then when you set your destination, then you're talking to the network, right? Uh, and that's why VLANs, destination MAC addresses, destination IP addresses, rate, you know, what rate you're testing. Like I said, it, it could be a 1,000 meg electrical port, but it might only be a 500 meg rate. And so you have to really, you know, set up for that rate. Um, so, so, so that's one of the big things that we see with, with our negotiate. Um, now, somebody's asking about how do you determine the frame sizes? Well, for me, it's really important to have a small frame size and a large frame size, right? So it depends on the type of network you're testing. Um, if you're doing RFC 2544, then you can do the seven frame sizes, right? Um, obviously, the more frames you test, the longer the test will run, so it depends on what you want to do. It's incredibly important to test multiple frame sizes, though. I've troubleshot a lot of networks, not a lot, some networks I've worked on had maintenance issues that were not maintenance issues, they were installation issues. Meaning during installation and turn up, that particular technician or customer only tested at say 1518. So they went to the maximum legal Ethernet frame size 1518 and tested it and it ran clean, they were happy. Then they handed it over to the customer and the customers put very bursty small frame traffic on the network and then it was taking errors. And now it goes to the maintenance department, they have to deal with it instead of the installation department. And it was never a maintenance issue, it was an installation issue. There was, you know, you, it wasn't validated for the appropriate services. So it's important to have multiple frame sizes. If I'm doing wide off 1564, I usually use the seven RFC because folks are used to seeing it. And then I add one jumbo if my network is capable of jumbo frames, right? I wouldn't necessarily go straight to 9,000 unless, unless you're being told to. I might go to, you know, uh, 1600 or something just to say it does jumbo frames, right? Um, <clears throat> and if I'm doing RFC 2544, the seven frame sizes. Uh, if you're pressed for time, then, you know, just, just do a couple. A small one, 64 and a 1518 and maybe something in the middle, right? It's, you know, <clears throat> it's, it, it really depends on your, on your SLAs and, and the determination between your customers, right? So, um, and so, um, so those are the, you know, the, some of the most common issues that we see. So, you know, essentially, you know, just to kind of recap what I talked about, um, you know, it's important to understand why you are doing this SLA testing. And you need to important to understand that Y.1564 and RFC 2544 are SLA testing, service level agreement testing. And so <clears throat> there's other tools like traffic generation TGen, um, you know, and other types of, of testing that can be applied for troubleshooting, right? So typically, if I am getting results that are faulty or not up to par or fails my SLAs, then I'll start traffic generation to test and find out what's going on, right? Because traffic generation allows you to set it for that specific frame size, and it allows you to test that particular frame size that's causing issues. And, and so just keep in mind that it's, although you can use it for troubleshooting, it's to identify the problem. But once there's trouble, then there's other tools that you can use to, to, to kind of qualify that. So, um, so we will be providing, you know, obviously this is recorded and will be available to watch later on. Um, and, you know, there'll be links and information that, uh, you know, th that'll be associated with it. And... Um, and that's it. So um, my name is Kevin Pires. Uh, I'm with Expo, and I hope you found this time valuable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today's event. So you can download the presentation in the resource uh, widget section, and if you would like to see it again, it will be available on our website at www.expo.com in the webinar section. And as a reminder, we would appreciate if before you leave today, you could provide feedback by completing the survey, and by doing so, you'll be automatically entered to win a $100 prepaid gift card. So that completes our today's event. Thank you. Thank you.